sickness, so traveling, traveling wasn't much of a possibility, but glad to join, join you all virtually. Uh, today I'll be discussing uh, using machine learning for customer segmentation. So this is something I'm pretty excited about. I think it's not done very much in, in the data science field. I think uh, I think it's something we could use in a lot of different industries. Um, as data scientists, I think the default way to approach a problem is supervised learning, right? The idea of can we predict customer churn by seeing who's churned before and seeing if we can find related metrics to prevent future customers from churning, which that's a great way of doing things. But there's also uh, value to approaching it from an unsupervised um, or clustering sort of way. So with that said, I'll start presenting on what I have. Let me know if you guys can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Great. Okay, yeah, so some topics for today. We'll go through the data. So we actually have some, uh, some sample data from my company, Bridge. Uh, we'll go through how we usually approach marketing, kind of the older way of approaching marketing, uh, how we think we can do it better, especially using our data, and then some recommendations we have for we'll use a sample client. So starting with the data, so we like to say we, uh, we have privacy safe customer level data. What does that mean? That means we can identify customers without ever revealing any personally identifying information. So the way that looks is a lot of our customers will give us transactional data from their systems. We'll go and we have a, an algorithm that basically identifies who we think made a purchase or group of purchases. And then we also have a whole bunch of data that we've modeled um, around interests, demographics, um, you know, car ownership, uh, pet ownership, just a ton of uh, really cool data fields. Um, and again, we do this all without ever exposing who a person is. So we never give away an email or phone number or name, any of that. Uh, it's all privacy safe. And we'll show you kind of how that data looks in a minute here. So touching on that bridge uh, matching. So we have what's called an identity spine. Right, that's the idea of a collection of a consumer's um, data points used to identify someone. So we gather that from like publicly available sources, social media, our partners, a lot of different places to say, okay, what, what is a customer and what are they interested in, right? Um, do they have a car? Do they own a home? Um, maybe what interests do they have on socials and stuff like that. And that forms our identity spine, which again, we use to create marketing campaigns that are really targeted to a specific um, person. So we talk about tailoring these campaigns, making sure we're advertising the right things to the right people. Uh, a classic idea I'd like to use is you're wasting money if you're a burger company and you're advertising um, you know, a double cheeseburger to somebody who's vegan, right? That's not, not really a good use of your ad dollars. So we can help, you know, maybe they release the Impossible Whopper or something, right? We can advertise these uh, more relevant things to the right people and reach them through a, a multitude of ways. So I'll show a sample of our data. So you can do things in Bridge, like show me all males in their 20s, who have a dog and enjoy camping. Maybe this is something we're asked for for a specific marketing campaign. So if you go into our data lake, you'll see I have this curated data, um, right? Gender equal to male, age between 20 and 29, uh, dog owner, and also has interest in camping and hiking. If I run that, you'll see this is what you would see in Bridge. So you can see, uh, this anonymized ID. So again, we're privacy safe. We never reveal any identifying information. The only thing our consumers are going to get um, is this ID, right? Which that ID is used for activating and marketing in various platforms. So they can tell us, you know, select all of these people who are male uh, in their 20s, own a dog, and are interested in camping and hiking. 
And we take that and go through our partners to advertise, right, through social media, through maybe mailing flyers, other things like this. Uh, and again, all privacy safe. So um, our clients are never directly seeing your data and marketing directly to you. This is done in an anonymized, high-level uh, fashion. You can see some of the fields Bridge can provide. So we have a little bit of location data, like state and county, right? Maybe we have a lot of regional restaurants or retailers. Uh, you know, if we have a company that's solely based in California, they don't want to be advertising to people in New York. So this is something we provide them. We have estimated household income levels, uh, mar marital status, um, you know, do they have a home pool, things about their house, things about, you know, if they have children, um, and then all their interests. So are they interested in fashion or sailing or uh, tech or home cooking, et cetera? So a whole multitude of, uh, of customer level attributes for our clients to select from. And with this rich data, we find it sometimes overwhelming to our clients, right? Uh, they'll come in and say, well, this is great, but like, you know, we're not used to having this data. We're not used to being able to uh, market specifically to a group of people. And also, um, you know, the kind of classical way, which I'll show here in a second, doesn't really fit in with this data. So it's, it's getting them used to using a new type of data and thinking in a new way. And also, I think the applications of data science here are, are enormous. So yeah, so getting into the classical approach to marketing, this is what we'll see a lot. This is what our, our clients first come in, kind of what we expect. They'll say something like, we've had a lot of luck in our outreach to 30 and 40 year olds who are single. We'd like to target this group with a social media campaign to try to get them to come back in. You know, maybe over the past quarter, they ran a campaign, had a little bit of success and want to keep it up. And we'll say, okay, well, we can create that campaign pretty easily. We'll go and let's create that campaign. So I'm going to use a tool here. It's really good for demonstrational purposes. It's called uh, SPSS Modeler. Um, so I've created some sample data. I'll show you how we can select down and create a campaign. So let's see what's in the sample data set. Right, it looks like exactly like what we have in our data lake. It's a group of IDs, um, some information about them, all these interest fields as well. And then we're going to select, you know, uh, 30 and 40 year olds. So age greater than 29 and less than 50. That'll give us 30 and 40 year olds and those who are single. Let's run a count and see how many we have. This shouldn't take too long. Should be just about done here. Yep, and you'll see. So that's about 596,000 people. Um, so, you know, they can go and we can activate that. We'll create a campaign. We'll go to our partners that they select and say, okay, um, you know, these people we want to see this advertisement or get this flyer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yep, so that's... That's how we would normally do it. They might come back to us, and this is commonly what we'll hear. They'll say, you know, the results were okay. Uh, we spent a lot of money. Uh, maybe we didn't get the results we wanted, um, but we're having a hard time understanding how we should focus our advertising budget, right? Now that we have this rich set of data that we can, you know, mess around with, how do we know how to apply it, right? How do I know who's buying what sorts of products? How do I know? Um, who to reach out to, and we're going to show them an example of how, how we approach this. Yep, so that said, uh, I like using dynamic segmentation, so this is where we talk about unsupervised learning. Um, I'll give you guys a model that I really like to use, but it's definitely a data-driven approach versus an, uh, like a human 
uh, assumption-based approach, right? A lot of times with marketing, we're making assumptions about who we think is coming to our brand or who we think we want to come to our brand. And those assumptions are, aren't necessarily correct a lot of the time. So now imagine Amy, the marketing leader at Cloud9 is looking to run a new campaign and bonus points to anybody who gets that reference too. Um, so Amy says, hey Dylan, we're thinking of running a campaign and we have a $10 million budget. Could you suggest some groups we can go after to increase our active customer base? And I'll say, sure, let, let me work with my team and see what we can come up with. So now we get to the cool data science part. Um, before I go into the methodology, I'll give you an overview of the algorithm we'll be using. So it's called Cajonan Self-Organizing Maps. You've probably heard some of them referred to as self-organizing maps or SOMs. Um, they're pretty popular in, uh, in transform transformations for neural networks, and they actually are a type of artificial neural network. Uh, but they're very different from the classic artificial neural network you might be used to. So it aligns well with like how we would do a PCA, right? PCA, we're trying to reduce the number of dimensions and get rid of some of the noise in the data. And the Cajonan self-organizing map is trying to do a very similar thing. So with this data, imagine I think we have, you know, 100, maybe 200 types of attributes some of them closely related, some of them not closely related. And this is where a supervised learning model would be quite difficult. So, or, you know, it, that's the classical approach would be a little bit harder, I'd say, than this approach, right? We'd have to look at all these associated groups. So if you own a pet, you own either a cat or a dog, we have a lot of confounding variables that we would have to go through, maybe run a PCA, maybe do a bunch of transformations, make sure there's no confounding variables before we could run a supervised learning model that says, um, you know, who do we think is, are the best customers, right? Um, so the opposite approach I'd say to that is let's let the model decide what variables are important and how to group people. And that's what a self-organizing map is great at. Um, it also versus normal neural networks you're used to, which use backpropagation, it actually uses a competitive learning to address its weights. So in the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more about what that means, but we're basically uh, creating random transformations, observing it afterwards, and then making adjustments to the underlying weighting. And we keep doing that until we converge at a place we're happy with. So yeah, so that process looks like you initialize the weights randomly up front, and then you're going to evaluate using Euclidean distances um, where these points are at the end of the process, right? So it's a transformation. It's going from all of these different um, you know, 100, 200 variables down to a two-dimensional map. So um, the cluster will be located. It'll have an X and a Y plane. Um, and based on that, we can say like who's closely related, right? So like, you know, let's say we have nine clusters and so you have X one through three and Y one through three, um, the opposite ends of the spectrum, the least related clusters would be, um, X and Y equal to one and X and Y equal to three, right? It's opposite ends. And so that's what it's trying to do. It's really trying to separate out groups that aren't related and cluster together groups that are related. So we we can uh, identify kind of what makes uh, the groups who shop at your brand um, unique. And then we can overlay things like spend, recency, how often they come in and identify our highest value clusters. So yeah, continuing on with the Kahona and self-organizing map, um, once we get those Euclidean distances after randomly selecting the weights, we'll go through, it identifies winners. So those are like the most central points in a group. And it takes all the neighbors around them and converges them. Basically it adjusts the underlying weights for them to converge into a group a little bit better. And then at the end of the process, it's going to decrease the learning rate. So it gets a bit less aggressive about those groupings. 
and it also decreases the neighbor size. So in one case, when you have a very large neighbor group that's going to get adjusted, um, over time, that group will shrink. So we make it basically less aggressive over time. And it's going to repeat that until it feels that um, it's converged. So basically, when it's when the Euclidean distances aren't moving very much at the end, that's when it, it's converged. And we can see a visual representation of this. So you see the data set in red on the top left here. And you can see the iteration two. So that's after a random initiation of weights. That's what the data set looked like from an X and Y plane, right? Still pretty clustered together. We'd like to see more separation. And you see over every iteration, it spreads apart until it reaches iteration 1,000, which you can see it's, it's much more spread apart than when it started. <clears throat> so yeah, so we'll go in and I'll show you how to use this map um, for this business problem. All right, so we're taking the sample data. I ran a Cohonan model. Um, here it is. So we have a model output and you can see it's suggested a bunch of different clusters. So. I'm going to show a couple of clusters and how we can compare them. So let's take this first one. That's the biggest one. It's about 12.2% of the data. And we'll take the second biggest. There you can see there's going to be some similarities, some differences. Um, it looks like age is fairly similar, right? Median in the blue one is... Oops. 58 and the median in the red one is about 56. Um, both love football, both have no interest in aviation, et cetera, et cetera. You'll see some things are different. So the red grouping doesn't have much interest in basketball, whereas the blue grouping does. And we won't go through everyone, but you can kind of see some things are the same, some things are different. That's going to be the case for every cluster. Um, it's interesting, this red group, what uh, their highest level of education completed was high school. The blue group is more college. And so on and so forth. We have a lot of, a lot of different fields we can go through. So next thing I'm gonna do is basically see, you know, who, who are MVPs? What are clusters that are the most valuable? Um, this might take a minute to run, but basically what we're going to see is based on recency, frequency, monetary, very common metrics used in CPG. Um, you know, how recent did a customer come in? How much did they spend? And uh, how many transactions do they have over their lifetime? And identify the highest value groupings, right? Those are the ones we really wanna focus on if you can get your high spenders to keep coming in, they're likely to continue to spend high. If you can get your high frequency customers to spend a little bit more, um, that's obviously really good because they have a much higher frequency. And if you can get your most recent customers to keep coming in, uh, you'll increase their frequency. So that's, that's the three metrics that uh, a lot of our retailers and restaurant clients use to, to gauge how well they're doing. And so we're going to overlay that on the clusters. Another really important note too, when we did this clusters, we only used the customer attributes. We did not use the RFM. And there's very good reason for that, which is we don't want to bias the clusters prematurely with RFM, right? If you're including these RFM measures in the clusters, inherently you're going to bias the, the clusters to look for that. And we don't want them to look for that. We just want to identify significant groupings of customer types. And then we want to overlay these important business metrics to see if any uh, any customer types are really over or under spending, right? So we can see, uh, here's the clusters. We can see there's some, there's some pretty high spenders here, right? compared to your low spenders, right? So look how much difference that is. This is like spend within a year. So the average spend of these four, of people within these four clusters is above $2,000 a year. 
Whereas these ones down here, they spend like, you know, 13, 14, 1500 dollars a year, which is pretty significant. Um, you can also see the number of times they've come in in their lifetime. It's much higher in these top groups. So, you know, 51, 50, 50, 45, whereas these lower groups, it's, it's a lot lower. So we'll take these, we'll call these our MVP clusters and label them as such. And then I'm basically converting a lot of these uh, string values to integers so we can do more of a um, statistical analysis on them. So one of the first things I really like to do within these groups is run a, a between groups test. So in this case, it's an F test. Um, and we're gonna see what variables are popping out as the most significant. So I'll go to the advanced view here, we'll do F test. So this is the F test score, um, degrees of freedom. So this is how many valid records there were within this group. And these, uh, these are basically proportions. These are all, well, most of these are flag values. So a mean of one means it's very high likelihood that they, that this, that they'll fall into this group. Whereas a mean of zero means that none of them fall into that group, right? So this top one's very interesting. So number of children zero, what that's indicating is uh, the people within the group who had no children. So we get some significant behavior, uh, behavioral differences between MVP one oops, and MVP four, right? So what we can see here is MVP one, two, and three, they weigh over index on not having children. So those groups really don't have children in the household. MVP4, way over indexes on not having zero children, which means that they have children, right? So that's very interesting. There's three groups that seem to be somewhat together, one group that's very, very different. Uh, within that group too, we can see that they have children. So, um, oh yeah. They have children and that's not what I was looking for. And they're married. Um, yeah. So that's what we can see here. Um, this family household composition, that means that they have, that they're married and they have one or more children. So it's about 68 and a half percent of people in this group, which is way over index on the population average. Whereas couple, that means they're married and um, do not have children. So you can see MVP1, uh, it's about 50%. So it's kind of a mix of uh, couples and non-couples. Two, the over-index on couples. Three, it's, it's kind of in the middle as well. And four, obviously, they're falling more into that family group. You can also see uh, diet and weight loss. So MVP2 tends to have a high affinity for weight loss and dieting, uh, three, a little bit of one, two, compared to those who weren't MVPs. One more I'd like to point out, ages in here somewhere, here it is. So I always like to look at the ages of groups. Um, you can see the age of these groups are pretty, are higher than the not MVPs, right? So higher than the others in the population. So when Amy reached out to us and she wanted us to run a campaign with 30 and 40 year olds, that was a poor decision, right? This is telling us that their highest spenders are really those in the higher age ranges. So it looks like, you know, 55, I don't know, 50 to uh, 70 ish. Um, the standard deviation is the number below. So basically, you can take within one standard deviation of the average, and that's kind of most of the group. So much, so a little bit higher than the population average. <coughs> um, I won't go through all these. I've actually already done that. So I'll show you guys what the outcome was and what makes these groupings unique. But you can see this is a pretty interesting way to identify um, some very significantly different types of groups that we can then go and tailor a marketing campaign to instead of just using a broad stroke pen and saying, okay, we're gonna to target to every 30 and 40 year old that we know about, right? So 
So with that said, we go back to Amy. We have a recommendation. Uh, we identified those four groups, so right, the MVP one, two, three, and four. And we found some very unique things about each group. So group one tends to be wealthy single older shoppers. So they over-index on income. They had a pretty, a very high income actually. Um, they were actually high school graduates with, uh, with no college degrees, uh, homeowners interested in health and home cooking, um, 55 to 70 years old, and no children in the household. Um, it's hard to interpret. So I think I'm interpreting a lot of these no children as maybe they've left the household. Right, that's just an assumption I'm making because they tend to be in the, you know, 55, 60, 75 age range. So a lot of these, I don't want to say that they've never had any children. And I think that's something we'd have to explore the data a little bit more to make a conclusion on. But there's definitely no children in the household for a lot of these. Um, group one's also single. So that might indicate, um, you know, either they might have had a divorce and they had children. They might have not had children. Etc. We don't know. We'd have to explore the data a little bit more, but they are currently single. Another thing to know, all these uh, groups had a very high interest in health and home cooking. So that's pretty interesting from Cloud9's perspective, because now they've identified a group that they can actually approach with a more broader stroke. So they can advertise self for these groups. And maybe they make like a mail or an email that says, hey, here's all of our new healthy food and here's some recipes for them that you can try, right? So this is ways that they can tell where that marketing campaign to really um, suit the interests of those who are shopping with them the most. Group two, they tend to be older married college graduates. So again, there's no evidence that they have children in the household. <laughs> they differ from group one in that they're a married couple. Um, they tend to be one of the higher age groups of so 60 to 75. Um, they actually uh, way over indexed on loving to travel, uh, loving sports. They have pets, uh, middle class income, um, generally college graduates. <coughs> uh, group three, older low income homeowners. So they had a, a lower income than the rest of the population. Um, again, tended to be older. Um, they like to garden, travel, sports, they have pets. And group four wealthy families. So that's the group we saw that had children in the household. Um, they over-index on income. They're mostly college graduates. Uh, actually, there was evidence too that they have white collar jobs. So that could be interesting in a marketing campaign to identify, um, you know, kind of what, what resonates with them. Um, you know, maybe, maybe they like the office or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, and so we came up with four very different groupings and now our brands can go and tell our campaigns to each one individually. Maybe they say, well, we just want to do one campaign, but we want to include everyone. So that health and home cooking might be a good idea, but this gives them a lot of flexibility and how to use their budget, where to use their budget. And we generally have much better results when we do it this way versus, you know, the broad stroke that, we're just guessing at who's going to come into your store. So with that said, I think that's everything I wanted to go through. Um, I know I went through a lot there. Uh, so I'll open up the room to, to questions and uh, discussion. Do you guys have anything? Okay, Dylan, can you hear us? I can. I think they're going around with the phone to capture audio of the questions. So you can bear with us. Okay. If you pulled in and that's not gonna work. Is there anybody online that has any questions? 
you can either unmute yourself and ask or type your question in the chat. Hi, Dylan, this is Oneti. Thank you for the great presentation. I am actually a faculty at U of I and I teach data science and marketing. I was curious how privacy regulations are changing some of these individual level data you guys are able to track right now from both a marketing perspective and also when you think about the work you're doing with machine learning, if you're not able to track individual data to this degree. Yeah, yeah. So again, with the privacy regulations, uh, we don't use uh, a lot of online data, we'll say. So we don't use like third party cookies. I know there's been a lot of very big changes recently with those. And we don't use a lot of online data. Like we don't, um, you know, we don't track or again, use cookies of any sort. Uh, we gather a lot of our information from uh, partner sources or modeled sources. So again, publicly available information. Um, and basically what we do is we create like a corpus or a um, library of these attributes and who we think they belong to. So again, we're privacy safe in a way that we don't ever reveal any sort of PII information. Um, and by doing so and not revealing that to our customers, they don't have to ask questions and we don't have to ask questions about um, privacy, right? Because they're running it at such a high level. So like you mentioned, we don't tell them, you know, here's the email address, go email this person, uh, your campaign. We do that in a uh, anonymized high level way. So they could come to us and say, you know, we decided group ones we want to go with. Uh, they would never see any more than that 190,000 random IDs, right? So there's no, again, no privacy concerns because they're not actually taking those or taking any PIIs to activate their own campaigns. We would then take those and activate them with our partners. So you, we use companies, you know, uh, all the common ones, LiveRamp, the Trade Desk, a lot of socials. Uh, we have partnerships with them where we have a spine and we map to their spine. And so we simply activate these IDs. Again, we don't send them uh, the names or anything. We'll send them these IDs, they map to their IDs, and then they activate these campaigns in an anonymized fashion. So I don't, so a lot of the privacy, I mean, we have to obviously be aware that we're, um, you know, never exposing anything we should at. We make sure we're aware. I know there's a little bit more scrutiny now on certain types of sensitive personal information. So we just got a notification from a few of our partners that there's a few laws that are changing around some things with location and um, religion and stuff like that. Those are things I tend to not use in my models just because you can create natural bias and I don't ever wanna do that, obviously. We all know the, most data scientists know the classic bank example, I forget. There was some bank who was using zip code data, which ended up biasing on ethnicity. They got into a lot of trouble and couldn't do that, right? I try to not use any data that would ever be uh, biasing. And we also, in our models, uh, try to identify bias, right? So, um, so making sure we're not ever using or doing anything ethically concerning, um, making sure we're only using variables that are right. Um, ethically, uh, I wouldn't say good to use, but ethically, um, not not likely to cause ethical problems, right? Like identifying if somebody has a pet or not is generally not going to be considered an ethical dilemma. <laughs> but I don't use things like religion, ethnicity, um, anything like that to ever identify how we do a campaign. That's all, right? That's, that's just things that we don't believe are... Um, you know, a good way to do things, nor do we think it's, it's, it's something that's going to be scrutinized in the future with privacy. And we want to get ahead of that and make sure we are, we are being an ethical company, right? Oh, I think we have some in the chat. Uh, I can go through those. <laughs> um, just to address one question that was brought up, we will have a recording of today's presentation. If you registered for the program, we'll send it out um, to the meetup group. Uh, the next question is, 
from Anaruda. One of the biggest questions with customer segmentation is data quality. Inaccurate data will usually result in poor grouping. How do we check the quality of data before running it through a clustering model? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is one of the first questions we get for most of our clients. It's like, well, you know, you say that that person's in that income range or that person's a high school graduate. Um, how do you know that? Uh, the answer there is we use many different data sources to validate and we actually return undefined. I'd rather say we don't know than give an incorrect answer. So if all of our data sources are disagreeing about something and we're not confident that we can make a decision on who we think a person is, we don't answer that. We say it's undefined. So that's one of the ways we do it. And again, just having a multitude, you know, we have many, many, many different partners that we can include in our model. That gives us a way to generate the confidence we have in an attribute, right? And we actually keep a confidence table too. So uh, one thing we'll get is, you know, a brand might come to us and they say, hey, we want to run on group one. There's 190,000 customers. We were more thinking we want to be in the 100,000 range. Can you filter that down? The first thing I'll do is I'll go and select these attributes in our confidence table and take the ones we're most confident in, the customers we're most confident fit in this group, and run, uh, run a marketing campaign on those. So I guess to answer your question, we validate our data by using multiple data partners um, is one of the big things. We also constantly monitor it compared to like the census to make sure, right, um, the fields that we're, we're assuming or the incomes we're assuming line up with the national averages to make sure we're not biasing or over-selecting on any groups. Great, it looks like Yana is going to go around the room and see if anybody else who is here in person has any questions and then she will type it into the chat so you can see. Okay, going about this in a roundabout way, but. <laughs> oh, here's one question. Is the main data source coming from the bank? What channel do we use to send promotion to these customers that we are targeting other than using cashback offer via online banking or mobile banking? Yeah, great, great question. So if you research right, Bridge and you'll see we're a carbolytics company, you would assume that we do things through the bank. That's not the case. We, uh, we're actually completely separate from the bank channel. We don't do anything with the banks. We don't collect any data. Um, we don't associate ourselves with the banks that Cardlytics does. Cardlytics is a very different type of business. They have a partnership with the banks and they manage the banking um, cash, or not cash back, the banking like coupons and stuff you would see. Uh, we actually don't associate with that at all. We are unique in that we have our own identity spine, uh, very separate from anything Cardlytics does uh, that we've developed through our partners, um, which are not banks. They're actually, a lot of them, that's what they specialize in is first and third party data modeling. Um, some of them specialize in credit. Some of them specialize in public data collection. Some of them specialize in social media data collection, um, but none of them are banks or financial institutions. Um, and then when we run, so we never run our campaigns through bank channels. All of our, ours are done through channels that you could easily access through like Live ramp or the trade desk or any of those. So a lot of social media sites, um, like Google advertising, I think is one of them. I'm not as experienced in what happens in the after. I just kind of manage the um, the actual like running of the campaigns and monitoring of the campaigns. But yeah, we, we do a lot of things with socials and Google advertising and just your common advertising channels, but we haven't done anything or I, currently we're not going to do anything with the bank right now. Great. The next question is, in the example, the transactional data was matched to the identity spine. How is that done? If Cloud9 doesn't know the unique ID, what are they providing to match this up? Yeah, so that's that's Bridge's uh, strength, right? That's our business is here. So the, we, the first thing we do when we uh, partner with a client, they send us transactional data. We run it through our algorithms. Uh, that we have to identify a person. So 
underlying POS data includes like tender, uh, so your tender number. Um, it includes some maybe first and last initial, um, lo location the purchase was made, things like this. And we take whatever our, our clients have, um, look in our identity spine and see if we can identify with confidence what person made that transaction. We can, we associate that anonymized ID to the transaction and that's what they receive back. So they can see their transactions in our data lake and who we think made them from an anonymized ID perspective. Was there a part two to that question or did I answer who you're looking for? It doesn't look like there was any other okay. part to that. Oh, if Cloud9 doesn't know the unique ID, what are they providing to match this up? Um, again, yeah, it's just done on the, the POS data and our identity spine. That's how the matching is done. They don't do any matching. Our clients don't do any matching. We do all, all of the matching. All right. Um, yeah, any, any more questions? Oh, it looks like somebody's typing one question in, if you can hang tight. <laughs> And Dylan, I know you can see it, but I'm going to go ahead and just read it out loud so everybody can hear. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> okay. Why is the design of your process not code based? What was the reason for that choice? Uh, demonstrational purposes. It is code based. That's not that's not what we use in production. That was more for demonstration. Um, obviously, like being able to show the clusters and stuff. And doing a really quick, dirty, quick and dirty uh, example on sample data. Uh, that's what we we're doing. Again, I like that tool. Uh, Modeler is really good for data exploration, um, designing a process. Uh, but we use we use coded solutions generally um, in production. So we use Snowflake is our data lake. We use what's called Snowpark, which is basically it's like an implementation of PySpark on Snowflake. So it's a massively parallel um, computing language. And then we'll usually uh, model within Snowpark and UDFs and then create the output in Snowflake. So yeah, our, this in production, we're, we're working on it. It's still uh, in its early stages, but in production, it's, it's a code-based solution. It's, um, yeah, that's how we design it. Excellent. I think Yana's, I can't tell if she is gathering any more questions. Um, Dylan, I had mentioned a few minutes ago that we would be sending out um, a recording of today's uh, program. Would you be able to send us slides or send email me your slides so that we can sync the two? Yeah, yeah, I can definitely send those over. Um, let me see. It says, thank you very much, Dylan. We will have two bridge members in the room introduce themselves to the audience and see if people have more questions for them. So we are ending the online portion. Thank you, everybody. Everybody, sorry for the technical glitches that we had to deal with. <laughs>